Um, I've not got my glasses on because then I can pretend I'm alone in the room and um, that comforts me as well as being surrounded by, thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do, if that's okay, is do a short reading from the start of the book and then like we can, I figured it's, it's probably better if rather than me just kind of talking at you for people to like ask questions and then it can be more directed by what you guys want to talk about because that's, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the book. There's, you know, well, obviously it's, it's a book of columns and there's, like, you know, there's all kinds of different topics and it can be directed by what everybody thinks is most, most interesting today. And so if you guys could um, maybe think up some questions, that would be really, really good. Um, yeah, I mean, normally that's not a problem in, in the US so much, uh, so like, which is great. Like, I, I mean, I, I was saying this to, to, uh, to you yesterday, but um, like, I, I, some, I, did, I sometimes do events in Germany, and um, everybody is very polite, and nobody wants to ask questions, because it's, it is just it's different in different countries. But then, um, then you say, really, really, no, no, it's okay if you ask questions, and then the person will be like, so... On page 70 of your last book, you said this. But on page 43 of your current book, you say this. And you're like, holy shit. They've actually all read it. This is very, yeah, anyway, like Germ German people are amazing. Um, I feel like that's a, an okay stereotype that someone's amazing. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning. And um, for context, okay, I should, I should probably give some context to the beginning of this book. Um, it's just the... It's just the introduction, and introductions are... I, I, th I feel like somewhere in the world there's somebody who enjoys writing introductions to books, but um, I, I've not met them yet, um, particularly to political books, because um, you know what, what you really want to say is, it's, it's all in the book, just read the book. Why do I have to introduce it? But um, uh, this was written... So the original draft for this book was handed in uh, on about November the 4th last year. And obviously, um, some things had to change last minute. And I, one of which was the introduction. I had to like completely, because you know, I, I'd written an introduction based on the idea that this would come out, you know, in the first six months of a Hillary Clinton presidency, and um, and everything would be about, you know, just pushing feminism a little bit forward, and you know, maybe being the more radical edge of you know neoliberal centrist feminism and saying, you know, it's good that we're finally making progress on abortion rights, but maybe we should think more about the economic consequences of, you know, and that's not where we are right now. We're in a, we're in a different trouser leg of time, as Terry Pratchett says. Um, so um, this book, this introduction was written on no sleep, well, almost no sleep, when everything seemed to be falling apart in kind of the white heat of being incredibly angry at the internet. Um, so please, please forgive. Anyway, Bitch Logic is the name. In case you hadn't noticed, there's a war on. The field of battle is the human imagination. This is a book about the hard stuff, about the painful places where theory crashes into flesh and bone. It's a book about desire and control and contested bodies. It's a book about gender and power and violence and about a world beyond them which is scarier still. As I write, it feels like the world is falling apart. A craven billionaire real estate mogul and reality TV television shyster has just been elected to the presidency of the United States, swept to power by a wave of racist rage and violent populism. The British government is collapsing after the worst political crisis in living memory. The centre-left opposition is eating itself. That is actually no longer true in the UK, and that's, that's one good thing. Um, bigots are getting brave in the streets and the stock markets are, are tumbling. That is still true. Not for the first time in my years as a writer and a political thinker, I find myself wondering why I still care as much as I do about gender, about sexism, about power and identity. Aren't there bigger things to worry about? Why can't we put these girlish things aside until after the revolution, when it comes, if it comes? I'll tell you why. Because if the women don't win, nobody wins. If queer people and marginalized people and freaks and outsiders can't live free, freedom is not worth the paper it's printed on. It is no longer an overstatement to suggest that toxic masculinity is killing the world. Feminists, of course, have been banging on about this in our shrill, hysterical way for years, but until the election of Donald Trump, the victories of the far right across Europe and the waves of violence against women and minorities that followed, nobody took us seriously. 
This book directly deals with that violence, with the alt-right and the radicalization of young men into extremism around the world, with the apoplectic male resentment that is consuming our culture from within. The feeling that men, particularly white working class men, have been cheated of their birthright is the root and center of this discord. They are right that they have been cheated, but dangerously wrong about who pulled the con. Some people believe that at times like this, the correct approach is to abandon identity politics and speak instead about class, and only class. Even on the notional left, the usual suspects are at pains to point out that geopolitical disaster could have been avoided if we had all been less precious about gay rights and women's rights and black lives and concentrated on the issues that matter to real people. Real people meaning, of course, people who aren't female or queer or brown or from another country. You know, the people who really matter. In the wake of successive victories for a new frightening nationalist capitalism, commentators from all sides of the self-satisfied chin-stroking debate school are blaming identity politics. What they seem to mean by identity politics is politics that matter to people who aren't white men in rural towns or young boys in bedrooms, convinced that their inability to get laid is an injustice that must be answered in blood and suffering. This is an idea that has remarkable staying power across a fractious and divided left. The idea that issues of race, gender, and sexuality are at best a distraction from class politics and at worst a bourgeois tendency that will be destroyed after the revolution. The logic is that by focusing on issues of social justice, the political class has abandoned real working people to the vicissitudes of economic hardship. Now, I, I actually am normally funnier than this. Like, <laughs> this is like, th there are jokes in this book, they're just not in the introduction, because I was really, I was really, really cross when I wrote this, and now I'm reading this back to myself, God, I sound like a bundle of laughs, don't I? And it just goes on and on and on, and yeah, yep, yeah, you know, <laughs> more socialist ranting, and, but it's, it's funny in the rest of it, I try and crack some jokes. I'm going to finish this little bit, and then we can get on to the, like, slightly less, everything is falling apart stuff. Okay. <laughs> The logic is that by focusing on issues of social justice, the political class has abandoned real working people to the vicissitudes of economic hardship. This notion is horribly wrong, and the worst thing is that it's wrong in the right direction, in the manner of a passenger plane that maintains a perfect flight path right until it slams into the field next to the runway. The, pol the political class has indeed rolled over and let kamikaze capitalism wreck the lives of working people around the world. Identity politics, however, have little to do with that cowardice. That the two are now yoked together in the popular imagination is something everyone who believes in a better world must answer for. All politics are identity politics, but some identities are more politicized than others. The notion that the politics of identity and belonging have been allowed to overwhelm seemingly intractable issues of class, power, and poverty is entirely correct, but this is not a problem for the left. It is a problem for the traditional right, which has pursued a divide and conquer strategy for centuries, pitting white workers against black and brown workers, men against women, native born citizens against foreigners in a hierarchy of victimhood that diverts energy and anger away from the vested interests, bankrolling the entire scheme. When they promise to give you your country back, is that not identity politics? When they tell you that Muslims and migrants and uppity women are the real threat to your security, is that not identity politics? When they tell you that you will feel great again, if only you stand behind the strong men waving the flag of white nationalism and chauvinist violence, what is that if not a politics of identity more dangerous than anything we've seen since the 1930s? It's a shell game, a con. It did not start with Donald Trump, but the real estate mogul and social media tantrum artist has taken the Ponzi scheme to its logical conclusion. The president and his fellow travelers and sugar daddies have committed political fraud against the entire Western world. They have compounded it by making us believe, as all good fraudsters do, that it was our fault for being so naive in the first place. It is to some extent reassuring to believe that it might be all our fault. If it's all our fault for being too politically correct, too committed to diversity, if it was liberals and leftists who messed up by listening to these whining hippies with their patchouli-scented ideals of fairness and tolerance and police not shooting young black men dead for no reason, we might not have to face the more frightening notion that what's happening is, in fact, beyond our control. The truth is that social justice and economic justice are not mutually exclusive. Those who would sacrifice one for the other will end up with neither, which is, of course, what the unscrupulous narcissists, man-spreading at the gates of power, are counting on. 
I'm going to leave it there because this does it does actually go on for ages and bloody ages and and I really somebody should have stopped me. Um, that's at some point somebody will. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's um, I would love to have a conversation with you guys about what seems germane right now and if anybody has any questions that would be great. And um, I've totally forgotten where my glasses are. I'm really sorry, but I'll probably be able to like pick out people. Go on. Thank you. Uh, first off, I want to thank you very much because when when things got really really rough and kept being really really rough for the past several months, whenever there was a big shitty event, I could always look forward to like, oh, Laurie Penny will write a, a oh, funny article you. about this in a couple days. So and that's that's obviously like that must put a lot of pressure on you. So when there's so many just things happening and interesting conversations entering the discourse, how do you as a political writer decide what to devote time and effort to and what things to maybe like hold off on? Thank you. Like, a cr this is a really actually this is a massive thing right now for almost anybody I know, not just, not just people who do political writing, but people who work in, in activism, in the arts. And I think, I mean, you can maybe speak to this, but like in, in a lot, almost everybody I know is deeply confused about where they should be putting their energies right now. And it's not just you know, people who are political columnists. Like I know I've spent like ages, I'm actually just going to write down the questions because they were interesting. Um, I've spent like loads of this past six months, just when I thought I should be like going like on my A game and bringing it every day. Like I've just spent days just like in this state of paralysis and inertia, not knowing what to what to write about or what to do, or if I should maybe just just jack it all in and, and go off and, and retrain as a nurse or a support worker or something that would be more useful than just writing on the internet. Um, I'm seriously, I, I did a lot of research into how I could do that, and I'm not the only one I know who did that. Um, I have not got a good answer for that, actually. That's, that's not me trying to dodge it. It's just me acknowledging that that's a really, really hard thing. Um, often, um, it's what... Well, you have to make a decision at some point if it's your actual job, and you have to just... Sometimes it's just you close your eyes and you point at one terrible headline in the paper, and, and, and there's like, oh, I can write about that catastrophe. But... Um, Sometimes, um, the good thing is that there are more and more people involved in this discourse right now. So I feel like, I mean, maybe this is like arrogant or something, but if maybe six or seven years ago when I was just starting off writing about feminism and certainly in the UK there wasn't as much of a big conversation around it, I kind of felt like if, if a news topic went by and I didn't write about it for some paper or other, then maybe nobody would. Maybe nobody would notice. And I kind of feel like at the moment, if, if I don't get to something, somebody else will, somebody else will get, get that. You know, it's not, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of us maybe have the sense that, that there is more of a tag team involved here. And what I'm hoping is, I think, actually, that, that is interesting. I feel like the sense of frantic competition among political writers, that's, that's not something I've felt as much lately. Because, you know, all journalists are mad ambition monsters. I'm sure there's a few writers in the room, and you know how that goes, right? Um, I feel like we have more of a sense collectively that we're, that we're all trying to do the same thing together and we have to lift each other up. Um, I, I hope, at least, is, if that's... Like, if, if any, I mean, that's probably more the case in... in I feel like New York is a really good place for writers to lift each other up. Maybe I, I'm not hearing any hollow laughter so far. There's a, a, there's a few smirks at the back, but certainly I came here five years ago and I felt there was much more of a community and much less kind of odd backstabbing. Um, maybe that just speaks to how terrible London is, but I don't know. <laughs> like, anybody else? You can, like, I mean, I, I, I put this here, so... If we run out of questions, people can just ask me about Star Trek because that's really what I want to talk about today. <laughs> so, like, uh, that lady was first. You were, you were half a second first. Actually, I was wondering if you could read some of the humorous oh, parts okay. of the book. <laughs> well, tell you what. Um, why don't you ask a question and I will um, I'll try and flip through to something that's a little bit funnier. <laughs> um, so... 
I've heard a lot of people talk about kind of how, I mean, in the midst of all this catastrophe, that maybe the one optimistic part of it is that people are more active um, and out in the streets and supporting each other in that way. And do you think, I mean, if this had come out in a Hillary Clinton presidency, would that have happened or could it have happened as quickly? Or do you think in the end, like, it will be better for political activists um, and, and the movement itself? Or what's the next? Thanks. Okay, this is a this is a really important question. So thank you. Like it's so back in the day before the election, there was a lot of talk about how you know it would actually be quite a good thing if Donald Trump was elected because then it would all come crashing down and and the battle lines would be drawn and that kind of has happened, right? And and this is something we also heard in Britain. I don't know who here is familiar with British politics at all. If you oh oh wow. Gosh, amazing. Um, but for those who aren't, you know, we had an election, we've had several elections, but the one we had in 2010, when the Conservative government, who've now been in power for eight years, finally came to power, what a lot of people were saying before that is, well, the Labour government have done such terrible things, you know, they're all centre leftists. What we really need is a Tory opposition, uh, and a, a Tory government we can really be opposed to, and we can properly remember what it means to be on the left and be activists, and that... Um, what actually happened is we have had eight years of austerity, which has just ground people down. And Britain is a much, much sadder and more bitter place to be, I feel, than it was uh, eight years ago. And that's not just because I'm now 30. Like, I feel that's like, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's objectively true as well as like, oh, my lost youth. Um, it's... I. There is more activism right now, and there is there are a lot of people being galvanized in in all kinds of different communities. The healthcare battle I know in the U.S. is much more kind of energetic than it was uh, certainly around Obamacare. People are starting to say, "Well, like it's not enough to defend Obamacare. We actually have to ask for single payer, and it's good. We want more." There's a sense that it's okay to ask for more, but like. Firstly, as a foreigner. Secondly, as like a white person who is middle class. I feel really uncomfortable saying that this was worth it. Because like, for, like, sure, it's worth it for me. I'm excited by all the activism, but like, I'm not somebody among the first wave of people whose direct lives are, are gonna be affected by this. So like, I, I always get very suspicious. And on the left, the people I hear making this um, accelerationist argument are normally like, angry white guys who, you know, there's nothing, like, within, in their proper context, angry white guys, fine. Like, there's a <laughs> there is a use for them, you know, in their proper place. <laughs> but um, it's, like, people who have not really, people who don't have skin in the game. And so that's why, like, it's, you are right, it is kind of true. There is this galvanizing thing happening, but I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's worth it. And that's where I go back and forth on actually kind of openly calling for revolution and, you know, like the people who, <coughs> I feel like people who openly call for, like, violent uprisings, so, well, firstly, it's, it's not my style anyway, but I think any, any movement of social change, which you have to go through a lot of suffering that's going to happen to people who aren't you on your f or your family, other people can call for that, but I'm not going to do it because it's not worth it. I can't make that call. Also because I don't write manifestos and I'm just a fucking journalist, you know what I mean? But, um, so, like, you asked for a funny thing, so I'm gonna, this is, like, this will be an experiment, because I'm gonna read from the, actually, one of the, I think it's the oldest column in the book. I wrote this, like, four or five years ago. Does anybody remember the nice guys of OK Cupid? Oh, a few nods. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a, I wrote a column about the nice guys of OK Cupid, and like I hope you don't mind. Like it, it's going to be take me thirty seconds to find it, but I'll I'll read from that if that's okay. Um. I wonder where it is. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Hang on. Hang on, I found one that is it, that, that may be... All right. I, f I found one about James Bond. Is if, uh, are you guys up for that? I wrote about... Ja like some, sometimes 
writing for the New Statesman, um, you'll, uh, I'll want to write about something very, very serious and about a kind of little bit of the latest welfare reform bill. And then my editor will be last minute, will say, oh no, we've already got somebody covering that. Can you do something about TV? And, um, and that's often, like, some of the best things happen that way, the last minute challenges. So I wrote, <coughs> I wrote about James Bond just before the last film. Um, and the piece is called The Tragedy of James Bond. There is something rather tragic about James Bond. In advance of seeing Spectre, the latest installment in the super spy sex murder franchise, I watched several of the old films again. The experience was like having your forebrain slowly and laboriously beaten to death by a wilting erection wrapped in a copy of the Patriot Act. <laughs> Savage and silly and quite pathetic. <laughs> James Bond is a guilty pleasure, but one in which the pleasure is increasingly overwhelmed by the guilt. Even Daniel Craig seems to know this. The actor acknowledged just before the premise of his latest turn as Bond that the character is actually a misogynist. A lot of women, he says, are, are drawn to him chiefly because he embodies a certain kind of danger and never sticks around for too long. Craig, who has fronted a gender equality campaign affiliated to Amnesty International and appears to be about as woke as anybody who has worked in Hollywood for 20 years can be, gives us the bond the 21st century needs. A character who is aware that he is both a relic and a thug and is surprised that he still gets to be the hero. Nobody is saying that James Bond isn't fun. On top of all the explosions and wacky gadgets, the Sean Connery era Bond movies are so mind-blowingly sexist that they are actually hilarious. <laughs> the, the revamped films aren't much better. The last time we saw Bond, he was watching a villain tie up his sex slave lover, place a glass of scotch on her head as the camera aimed at her cleavage, then shoot her just to prove how evil he was. Again, this is gross enough to be funny until you remember that this is the guy we're supposed to be rooting for. It's possible to watch the films ironically, but is, it is hard to sustain a rigorous internal critique when the scenery is blowing up and Dr. No must be stopped. Ultimately, it is terribly difficult to sustain an ironic erection. <laughs> to do so involves a kind of anxiety that the men and boys of the 21st century know very well. The new Bond films work because they tackle the anxiety head on. Um, there's some stuff about Skyfall here. Daniel Craig has not been given enough credit for taking a character who was a cardboard throwback even in the 60s and playing him straight as a wall-eyed, traumatized thug, a protagonist who is two-dimensional precisely because he is empty inside. Craig animates the automaton that is Bond by asking just what it would take to make a person behave in this way. And like any piece of well-done puppetry, the effect is sinister. Daniel Craig is the Bond we deserve. Uh, Bond who takes seriously the job of embodying a savage yearning for a lost fantasy of the 1950s. It is about masculinity, yes, but also about Britishness, about whiteness, and about heterosexuality, and about the loss of all these things, uh, the certainty of all these things in a changing world. This is why I agree with Roger Moore that Bond cannot be played by a woman or a person of color except in pastiche. Bond's whiteness and maleness are as much a part of who he is as the gadgets and the sharp suits and the ram romanticism of alcoholism. Indeed, um, these are almost all of who he is. The franchise is dripping with nostalgia, with camp nostalgia for a time that never really was, a time when men could be real men, which meant they were allowed to, to hurt whoever they wanted and get away with it. It's right up there in the job description, licensed to kill. Bond is the kind of hero he is because he is allowed to do anything he wants to anyone he likes, from harassment to outright murder, all while wearing snappy suits and driving cool cars and get getting every single one of the girls for a very suspicious value of getting. He is a dangerous sociopath, but he is our dangerous sociopath. And we have to root for him because, goddamn, look at the other guy. He's got an eye patch and a cat. And he, <laughs> and he dresses like your granddad if your granddad was the weird judge of Project Runway. Um, the license to kill thing always bothered me on a logistical level as much as an ethical one. Before the opening credi credits even roll, this time Bond has caused enough mayhem to keep some poor desk clerk occupied in paperwork for a year. You wonder whose job it is to follow Bond around with a stack of forms and a can of disinfectant explaining his behavior to grieving widows and elderly parents who don't understand why their daughter has been petrified in gold paint by goons and left to die in a hotel room by some sleazeball she's just met. The problem, look, the problem with the way we watch Bond is not that Bond is a killer. I rather like films about serial killers, the gory thrillers that seduce you into rooting for the twisted anti-hero over the good guy. 
The problem with Bond is he is supposed to be the good guy. He is a borderline rapist who is employed by the government to murder people. And yet he is not an anti-hero, he's a hero. If your child said they wanted to grow up to be Hannibal Lecter, you would be worried. <coughs> But somehow Bond gets a pass, and come Halloween, a legion of little boys will be dressing as 007 with the full support of their doting parents. The Dilemma of James Bond is a pantomime vision of, version of the dilemma f facing most men who grew up watching the films and wondering what it would be like to be that guy, the guy who everybody seems to love not in spite of the awful things he does, but because of them. In real life, anybody who behaved even slightly like James Bond would be ostracized, arrested, or both. And that's the problem. Bond is supposed to be a hero, but if you knew him in real life, you will be warning all your friends not to invite him to their parties. That disconnect follows men home from the cinema and into their daily lives, because most of the behaviors that are supposed to make you a hero, the things that you're still supposed to do if you want to be a strong, respected, manly man, also make you an asshole. And um, this goes on. Yeah, it's, um, uh, that's kind of, like, what, what I like is taking the, like, Try, trying to take the piss in a way that, that, is, that is in some way relevant. Like, I, there's a lot of um, the conversation about masculinity is sort of, seems really, really alive at the moment. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or wants to speak about that. Maybe somebody who even is a man, because your, your opinion might be relevant, maybe? I don't know. I'm not actually, if, if you think I'm looking at you, I'm not. I've not got my glasses on at this stage. So, like, I, I don't know who anybody is in the audience. I, I think I met you. But like, hey. Hello. I mean, I guess I need to do that. Um, oh, thank you. So uh, kind of going back to something you said earlier about how there is a time and place for angry white men in the right mm -hmm. context, I think after reading that, after hearing you read that passage about James Bond, I'd love to know what context that is. <laughs> it's a serious question also. Oh. Look. Um, the role of angry white men. Look, it's um, so angry white guys are a problem, obviously. And uh, I, I wrote something for Teen Vogue this week, which I was really excited to be able to do, um, about anger and how women and men are taught to express anger differently. And one of the things that um, uh, it's a line I I, I use because, um, but it's actually something I I kind of cribbed from the mother of a friend who I happened to be staying with at the time, uh, which is that um, men, uh, girls learn to disguise their anger as you know, hurt and fear and, 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 and kind of victimhood, and boys learn the opposite. I think little boys grow up learning that anger is the only acceptable emotion they can actually show. So a lot of you know, pain and fear and vulnerability gets transposed into the key of rage. Um, and um, you know, this is kind of where I fall down a bit because I'm, I can be a little bit, I've been told I can be a little bit kumbaya about this stuff. I can be a little bit too empathetic with other people's mental health problems and, and I kind of constantly want to be listening and empathizing and, and I think whilst that's good, it's important to understand that while, you know, I'm sorry that people are angry and hurt and upset, um, what matters is not how you feel, it's, um, it's what you do with it. And that is Dumbledore, and that's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> I actually, I had to take that line out of the, out of the Team Vogue piece. I was like, I'm sure I've heard this before. That, sound, that sounds very wise. Someone white, I was like, oh yeah, Dumbledore. Yeah, I can't like it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what upsets me sometimes is that kind of... The guys who I feel are really on my side and, and maybe on our side, I don't want to kind of assume common cause with everybody in the room. People may have their different opinions, but the guys who I feel are on my side are often the slowest to come forward. Um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes because, sometimes because they think, oh, well, it's not my place to be an outspoken feminist or to, you know, maybe I'm white knighting if I defend people. I, I think that phrase, white knight, should be banned because it's just about shaming men for standing up for other people. Um, but I feel like one of the uses for angry men might be in standing up for people who aren't white 
and male when they see stuff happening either online or in real life. I really think that people should be bolder about doing that because often white guys are the people who have the least consequences to face for standing up. And sadly, in the kind of online cultures that I'm part of, they're also listened to much more. Like, um, you know, a, a, a guy saying something, you know, bold. Like, in... I'm going to try not to say Gamergate too often in this talk because, like, if you say it three times, like, you know, some <laughs> the trolls come out of your computer and, like, <laughs> rip, rip up your hard drive and start installing all kinds of terrible spyware in your games. But, um, yeah, in, in, that, in that movement, in, in Gamergate, um, that's two, um, the, the people who were, you know, some of the men who were coming out and making the case for openness and diversity in games, they didn't get half as much harassment and awful stuff happening to them as, as the women involved and the queer people involved. And, um, and that's, that's still the case. The stakes are lower. So I guess that's one. Can you think of any other uses? I'm sure there are other uses. I mean, like, like they, they, people are useful. Like. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm sorry, I'm chewing gum, which is a little rude, but um, I mostly just wanted to say thank you too because um, your, I find your work remarkable and it has been game changing for me. Um, and I used it uh, this year in teaching high school kids uh, in a feminism class. So I'm hoping that they spread yeah, the gospel. Yeah, indoctrinating the um, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. And And they actually got really into it, it was hard to, these were kids who elected to take a feminism class and it was still hard to get them engaged in a lot of writing, but they were engaged with your work. So, um, but uh, the masculinity stuff I think is what I have found, I haven't actually found a lot of other um, writers, certainly from a feminist perspective, mm -hmm. talking about masculinity and writing about it the way that you do. And I think it is from that empathetic standpoint, right, to say, um, you write a lot about the way that it's destructive, these sort of gender roles are destructive for everybody, right? And the mm -hmm. way that these constructions of masculinity are destructive to men and women and people of every gender, right? So um, I guess sort of I'm interested in a, yeah, you talking more about that, but um, if there are people that you read that you're inspired by, you know, because I have not, other than maybe Michael Kimmel, but it's like, who else is writing from this perspective, I think? Oh, masculinity specifically? Yeah, or sort of, and... Um, I haven't found enough of it in a, from a sort of feminist perspective. So. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, th th that was hugely flattering. Thank you very much. And um, I'm like, that, that's what I, what I love to hear because like, I, like my ideal readers, this is why it's bloody pink and green. You know, I'm just really hoping that some teenage girl somewhere will pick this up and it's like, it's meant to look cool. Covers do matter. You know, you can like, but... Um, Actually, the f my first person who ever read this was my friend's 14-year-old daughter, and she gave it the seal of approval, and beyond that, everything is gold. Um, the coolest person I've ever met. Um, but in terms of masculinity and writing about masculinity, I think we are approaching a watershed of people writing about it and talking about it, but we're not quite there yet. There have been a couple of interesting books. One of the ones I, I like most is um, a book called Man Up, by uh, Jack Irwin, who is um, like uh, a, a writer I know uh, in the UK. I've not seen as much of it in the US. In the UK, we're starting to have this conversation. And Jack is, is very young, actually. He's, he's, he wrote this book when he was 23. And um, he's also one of the nicest men I've ever met. He moved to Canada to marry a girl he met on the internet and now works as a butcher. Like, this, this kid is amazing. Like, like I've, I finally met him in person because we, we were internet buddies for a while and, um, and, and that's what he decided to do with his life and, and it's just wonderful. Um, but like, so something I said in the previous book, Unspeakable Things, was that like the, f the first rule of man club is you don't write about man club, you don't talk about man club. Like you, the, you're allowed, I feel like you're allowed as a guy to be an expert on everything but your own gender, whereas obviously for women in politics it's the opposite. Like it's the you know, gender and, and, and femininity is the only thing we're really allowed to be experts on. You know, by, we're meant to be born knowing how to do gender. Like uh, Judith Butler would disagree, obviously. Oh, somebody laugh. Go on. <laughs> I made a Judith Butler joke. Somebody laugh. <laughs> I think it was funny. Anyway, sorry. Um, but 
it's um I would really like to see more men write about it, but actually there's so much social censure in terms of men writing about mescu- masculinity. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates obviously does a fantastic job, and, and that's in, in um, Between the World and Me. He, um, he, there, there are elements of the discussion of masculinity in that, just as there are elements of the discussion of, of masculinity in, in James Baldwin, who is his, his model. But there is not... Um, I really want to see young men taking on this topic. Um, not that ta- I, I think I've just called Tanahasi Coates old, which he's not. Like he's kind of a, a timeless, or timeless author for our times. But I'd love to see. I want to see teenage boys writing about this stuff. Um, it's what I would say though is um, I've kind of got a bit. Obviously, like empathy and fluffiness is is a little bit my thing when it comes to masculinity, but I have got a little bit less fluffy over the years. Like I've been a, I've been a bit worried because in Unspeakable Things, there's a, there's a whole chapter about men, and you know I really make the case that you know it's you know it's not really your fault, it's patriarchy's fault, and you're not the patriarchy, and that is true. But like, I kind of lost some of my tolerance because I wrote that when I was 26, and I'm I'm 30 now, and I've had three extra years of dating and you know I've <laughs> seriously that's why like our politics are formed on the personal level I, I've lost a lot of patience with guys because you know I've, I've, I've had to be intimate with more of them and I'm now done with that actually I'm just done um, but yeah I, I kind of worry about I, I was a little bit worried because some people have said, oh, you know, as, as a man, this previous book meant so much to me and, and it felt like you were so welcoming. I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe skip some of the chapters in this one because you seem really nice. Um, yeah, so maybe somebody who's less broken by the world can write another book about masculinity. <laughs> Anybody else? Go on. you were first. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I work in media, and something I've been thinking about a lot is how to deal with the worry, and I don't know if that's a fair word for mm. the way you think about it, but that you're just preaching to the choir, that everybody who buys the book is going to agree with what you're saying implicitly, and whether you think, how, like, is that a bad thing, even, or how do you think about that problem? Thank you. Uh, so, about preaching to the choir. Look, it's, so quite a lot of the th- Quite a lot of the work I do is about comforting comforting the afflicted rather than just afflicting the comfortable. But one thing, one thing I've learned after seven years on Twitter is that it's really hard to get people to change their mind about anything, actually. The amount of people who will listen to a factual, reasoned argument and turn around and say, hang on, I was wrong about that, is vanishingly small. And actually, some of the most good you can do with political writing is speaking to people who are on the fence and speaking to people who are maybe like not a member of one camp or the other, but who are trying to articulate something that may, they may have already been thinking. I think there is, there is value in that for me. Um, but that's partly because I'm not an academic. I don't do research. I'm not an investigative journalist who can really kind of uncover hidden truths. I'm more about... Uh, cultural nar- narrative and analysis, and uh, I, I prefer to be. I actually, I, I realized I wasn't a proper journalist when somebody gave me an astonishing scoop, and I had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> and I sat on it for two weeks until it broke in some other paper, and I was like, this sucks, but this was never going to be me, really, so I should just embrace it. But yeah, I don't think. There is a separate question about the polarization of media, and I think in in America that's I, I've I've read lots of analysis about how those filter bubbles work, and as I understand it, it's really really hard to break through to somebody who, for example, only watches Fox News, or um, how did um, how did the BBC described Fox News the other day on a, on a fantastic BBC comedy show? What was it as um, Fox News? It's like the regular news took a bunch of meth and screamed its opinions into a bin. <laughs> like <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that seems like it. I sometimes watch it. It's insane. Um, not not in the good way. Um, but you know, but some of the problem with with TV. I feel like in in America. I mean, please tell me if I'm wrong on this, but. I feel like in the US, it's kind of the opposite in terms of print and, um, and broadcast media. 
Because in the UK, we have the BBC for, uh, for radio and, and TV, and we have certain standards. And even our other channels are partly publicly funded, so they have this duty, sort of duty of objectivity, which, I mean, practically speaking, it means that you get two people who don't agree with each other. You have them shout at each other for seven minutes, and then you cut to a story about bees. Like, <laughs> that's, that's how the BBC works. It's fantastic. Um, but then our, our, our print media and our newspapers are where you just get people screaming at each other. I mean, the Daily Mail is one of the most vicious publications. I mean, it's not, you can't call it a newspaper. It's not news. It's just, I mean, they th this is a newspaper that came out for the black shirts, for the British fascists in 1930, and nothing they've done since has been inconsistent with that standpoint. You know, it, I mean, they, they, they love war, so they were kind of supporting our efforts in the war. But apart from that, you know, pretty, pretty pro-fash right the way through. Um, but I feel like here, um, it's, the, um, it's the newspapers which are more reserved and more considered. And you have your tabloids, but, you know, nobody thinks of, like, uh, apart from, you know, crazy right-wing people. Nobody, nobody really believes that the New York Times is like a kind of bastion of left-wing conspiracy. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the TV networks that are really off the rails. So I, I don't know how you... And I feel like in some ways that's more damaging because... I'm, I'm going to try and find a way to say this without being completely insulting. Um, and probably I'm not going to manage it. But, like, some people don't read. And... Like, and, and no, but it's, it's a real, I don't know if this is true, okay? Because my bullshit sense pings. I do actually have one, even though I'm not an investigative journalist. But um, about uh, six months ago, I was looking into literacy rates around the world, and it turns out that about 14% of people in the United States have either no literacy or only basic literacy. And I feel like that's something that we're missing when we're talking about media strategy, in that is that like a lot of people will, you know, they're not on Reddit or you know doing things on the alt right because they can't, they don't read very much. They can't really read very much. They get everything through TV and radio, and they're purely consuming. And I don't know, I don't know how that how true that is. That every figure I found like said that that was true, but I, I kind of don't want to believe it. So. I don't know. Do you work in like you you work in broadcast radio? Yes. Oh, I feel like there are probably some fascist podcasts out there. <laughs> I've seen that, those guys on YouTube. It's kind of like yeah. Don't, don't do yourself that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Like I'm gonna start talking about Star Trek if nobody wants to ask questions. So like, <laughs> thank you. And it somewhat relates to um, something you just mentioned about uh, uh, America and TV. You st said a statement that you wished more teenage boys would write about masculinity. Mm -hmm. And so as a quasi-academic, how can that happen if they aren't being taught these elements of masculinity, especially if they are just watching television? Oh, my God. So like I'm sure, you know, I don't know that you have the be-all answer, but it's like something to think about. It's like, how can we groom them? Who? How to, how to groom young boys? <laughs> like, that's, a, <laughs> that's a question I wasn't expecting. Um, but, like, um, I feel like there's... As a female person, I can't ever give young men permission to talk about masculinity. I feel like that has to come from other men, sadly. And, and from teachers as well, from teachers of all genders. But I feel like just giving boys permission to talk about this. Because look, one thing I've one thing I've come across in like years of of writing and talking about this is that like men do really want to talk about this stuff. Um, when you ask, like uh, at some point, I want to kind of do like a, a podcast or an interview series with like how many men I know um, like will just tell me the most intimate random stuff about their experience of being a man and like these are people who like I have told them that I'm a feminist investigative journalist you know I feel like I need to be upfront about that before people reveal to me possibly criminal things they've done but that doesn't put them off <laughs> like they will like the, the like and I and I realize that they have never talked to anybody about this stuff before just what it's like to be like it is genuinely 
I have, I really believe that it's genuinely painful to be male in this world for almost everyone. It's, it's, I think it's more painful to be female. That's, it's an interesting thing about the way we talk about mental health at the moment, that all the conversation about mental health and gender is focused on you know, the high male suicide rates. And that's true, male suicide rates are, are three times as high as uh, completed suicide rates for women. Suicide attempts for women are twice as high, and rates of diagnosed depression and anxiety are twice as high for women. And I think for me, like I started off as a mental health journalist, um, and uh, like for me, looking at that, you know, when we get beyond the who is madder and sadder, men or women, like surely the answer to that is that there is something about gender that is deeply disturbing right now, and, and the experience of masculinity and femininity, like, it's not a competition, they're painful in different ways, but, like, you're not allowed to talk about how painful masculinity is, and I think unless people talk about how painful it is, that we won't get to fixing how damaging it is for men and for other people. Does that, do, do any guys want to shout at me about that? Because I'm just going to carry on saying what I think about your gendered experience until you do, so sure. Some people are nodding. Oh, thanks. Go on. I think we've got time for maybe like one more question, if anybody wants to ask one. Otherwise, it will be Star Trek time. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's a, let's have you, and then there's a person at the back as well, so. Um, so, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned um, in the first draft of your the introduction, you talked about different ways in which feminism should be pushed mm -hmm. under a Clinton presidency, and um, you mentioned um, the economic consequences of, you know, abortion rights kind mm -hmm. of as one of those things. And I was curious um, what some of the other ways were and which of those um, and how to push those, to push feminism further in those ways now, Thank with you. things being the way they are. Thank you. Look, so, in the introduction, the kind of now lost introduction, um, that I, I do talk about like ways feminism needs to go further, but actually, one of the, one of the good things about politics right now, like further to what you said about, you know, is it a good time for activism, is really, um, I don't think people are being reserved in their demands right now. There has been this, particularly in the Obama years and the new, new Labour years, there was this idea that progressives and people on the left could only ask for so much. But now there is this sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we may as well ask for what we actually want, and we may as well ask, but we may as well stop being on the defensive because we are forced into these much starker battle lines. So, I mean, talking about abortion in the book, I still talk about abortion being free and on demand and no questions asked. Which, like, I I'm probably more hardline about this than a lot of people, particularly in the U.S. Like, I I, I truly believe there should be no restrictions on abortion at all, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, but uh, like I, I still think that's the case, and, and I meet people, a lot of people in the US who are now just, just arguing for that straight up, not saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't have this horrific, you know, legalized rape by instrument restriction in Arkansas, or, you know, was it Arkansas, were they doing that? And now there's, now I think Georgia now, people who have been raped now have to get their rapist's permission to have a termination. It's just like, it, it's beyond, it, it's Gilead, you know, it's The Handmaid's Tale. This is completely, you know, y you, you really have a problem with misogynist religious fundamentalism in this country, maybe not in New York, but, and not that, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a different country to the one I'm from. But, like, I, I don't think that those, I don't think it's a time to soften our demands in any way in terms of feminism, far from it. And that's what I saw on, on the Women's March, for example, like people were not just saying, hey, let's not take away all abortion rights. Let's, you know, let's, let's actually extend them while we're about it because we're going to have to fight anyway, so we might as well ask for what we really want. But I think it's also um, what I envisioned and I think what a lot of people envisioned because 
you know, there have been books coming out about Clintonian feminism. Um, Clintonian is a great word, actually. <laughs> Weird. Um, uh, people envisage having to push centre-right, neoliberal feminism further to the left. And the important, the important thing there is understanding that well, you have to be intersectional about feminism, both in terms of race, class, gender identity. You can't just push a kind of feminism which only works to liberate women at the top of the economic and social pile. And um, you can't have... It, feminism makes very little sense if you don't also talk about race and class. And that's, that, was kind of, that was kind of the point. And, and it's still the point. And, and I think, you know, for... Like you were saying, that. The Trump era has clarified a lot of the stakes. I hope that's... And maybe we have one at the back? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh -huh. I may... This may be the struggle to articulate. It has to do with your piece on Milo uh -huh. and the experience of a sex educator here in the States named Lacey Green. Oh, yes. So th it has to do with... I think it has to do with how we deal with anger and mm. values of community. It's the question of... Um, in the feminist community, is it possible to be angry and still communicate, communicate across boundaries created by anger? Or is it the case that, um, it will always be the case that someone who tries to communicate across one of those boundaries will be considered to have violated the norms of the community. You will, you've you've, you've um, offered too much empathy, too much listening. You've mm. treated the, the, the wrong side like people and that's not adequately expressing how much rage there needs to be mm. at these people. Yeah. Um, I was very struck by the experience you had when your Milo piece came out. I'd love to hear your comments on Thank that, you. but also I'm just thinking about it broadly because of Lacey Green in that situation. So I've not, thank you. So I've not followed everything that's happened with Lacey Green. As I understand it, and I might be wrong about this, Lacey Green has sort of been co-opted and maybe slightly brainwashed and is... Uh, well, that seems like what's, what's happening. I, I, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but she seems to be, you know, attacking social justice warriors and, you know, uh, being on the side of some people with some very dodgy views. And, you know, when I... The two pieces I wrote about Milo Yiannopoulos and his, you know, his crew of young alt-right guys, I had a lot of pushback um, when those pieces came out, because I, I, I wrote them in, in a way that I tried, to, I phrased it very carefully, and I tried to write it in a way that didn't excuse the behaviour, but sought to explain. And I still think that's valuable, um, but I also understand why people took issue with it. Like I, I really do. And there is a strong tradition, particularly within British journalism, of no platforming fascists and no platforming the far right. Now. Personally, obviously, I thought a lot about this because I had a lot of a lot of people calling me a fascist sympathizer, and it was a really hard few weeks. Um, I don't think it is possible to adequately no platform somebody's ideas in the age of social media. I think that you know when the no platform policy was in instigated by the British National Union of Students in the 80s, it really was possible to deny somebody a public platform by refusing to invite them to certain events and refusing to print their views. And I follow that tradition by not actually printing. Like I don't like you know Milo told me all kinds of bollocks about what he apparently thinks about lesbians and Muslims and I don't print any of it because we know what he apparently thinks it's not interesting to anyone I'm interested in the personalities and what drives people to this and I but I think you have to you have to be very very careful and I think you do have to be careful where you apply empathy and where you draw the line between being empathetic towards individuals and being absolutely ruthless when it comes to action um and that's, kind of, that's the point I was trying to make in terms of... I'm, I'm really glad we got to this question, actually, because it's something I've puzzled over a lot. Those pieces aren't in this book. Um, I, like, not having so much empathy that it blinds you to consequences. And there actually there, there is a place for all kinds of political action in those terms. Like, I personally don't think no platform works. 
But I'm not going to tell anybody else not to do no platform because it's not my job to tell anybody else how to do their activism. I don't think it's like, I, I, I'm not sure it works that well, but I'm not going to tell people that they're fascists for doing it. That's not helpful. Um, I do think, and maybe this is something that people like Lacey Green are encountering, and I came to this opinion after the pieces came out, I think it is possible to have too much empathy with young white guys sometimes because like look women are grow up we're trained to have empathy for men and to put ourselves in their shoes people of color are, are, are grow up learning that you have to have empathy with white people and try and imagine what people are, things are like from their point of view and generally speaking it doesn't actually work the other way around and that's something i find hard to hang on to that whilst you know i'm trying to understand what it might be like for these young boys being seduced by this fascist leader they're not trying to empathize with what it might be like for me or people like me or people less privileged than me who they're attacking and i think that has to be you have to remember that did that answer anything like this is still an active question for me so thank you for bringing it up um, i think that's about it i'm gonna sign some books and but like like thank you all very very much for coming on, on a hot thursday evening and it's been really, really like a great honor to be at the Strand. So thank you very much. <laughs>